Hello everybody, Kevin Dennis, Gravitech Systems Incorporated. Welcome to those of you who have been following us for the past several weeks. For those of you who are just first joining us and clicking through, every Thursday at this time, we do some little education session, some 15, 20 minute block on some fall protection rope access or rescue topic. So welcome aboard. I encourage all of you to enter comments into the comments box. I actually have to apologize to a few of you is that comment section on our website was hidden from our view for a few days so it took me a little bit of time to get back to you all but I'm on it now we can see it I can see all your comments so I encourage you all throughout these sessions to enter comments in the chat box and you'll hear from me you know day of or next day uh, to answer any questions you might have I also encourage you to go to our website gravitech.com and if you follow the menu bar there's a link there for gravitech TV where you can see all of the previous sessions this is our fifth or sixth session there's a lot of good information on there. Feel free to use these for your toolbox talks, ongoing training, continuing education, safety meetings, however you see fit. During the pandemic, this is just our way of staying in contact with you. It's a little connection of you to us. And you know it increases our clicks, increases our website traffic. It's all good all around. So we took a break last week, but we're back at it. And this week, actually due to one of your viewers' comments, is we're going to introduce and talk a little bit about horizontal lifelines. Horizontal lifelines can be a very big topic, especially when you get into the engineering and designing of them. So my objectives are, are quite minimal for today. Is Number one, identify what a horizontal lifeline is. Discuss why horizontal lifelines are different than other fall arrest systems. And then lastly, discuss uh, what OSHA, as well as every state, the M385, Army, uh, or sorry, Navy regulations, province, provincial regulations, what they talk about and what they're looking for in horizontal lifelines. The scope of what we're doing today is we're gonna deal with flexible systems, okay? Is there the ones that cause the most consternation for people, whether it's made of rope, wire rope, synthetic strand, webbing. Uh, I'm not gonna deal with rigid systems as they behave a little bit differently. So the scope of today is the, uh, the flexible systems, if you will. So I'm going to start with defining a horizontal lifeline. Okay. Any time that you have two anchors and you have a line running in between those anchors to which you're connecting to, it's a horizontal lifeline. People will argue with me, they'll say, well, it's for travel restraint, so it's not a horizontal lifeline. Nope, it's a horizontal lifeline. If you've got two anchors or more, you might have intermediates, but once I have two anchors and I run some type of material in between them, and I connect to that material, it's a horizontal lifeline. Whether it's foot level, overhead, could be five feet long, could be 500 feet long, it's still a horizontal lifeline, okay? So that's the first thing to do is identify a horizontal lifeline. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the differences in between a vertical system and a horizontal. So let's come over here. So I've got a little system head up, set up, little mock demonstration. Imagine workers in a harness, they're connected with a lanyard into an anchorage connector, into a uh, anchorage, okay? This is considered, a, or what many people would call a vertical system. Worker falls, equipment comes under load, energy absorber deploys. Whenever you're in a vertical system, whatever force is in that system, or whatever that system controls or generates, if you will, that's the load that's gonna go on the worker's body, equipment, ultimately anchorage, okay? So this little demo, I've got a personal shock absorber in here with an average arrest force of 900 pounds. So when that worker falls, their body's gonna be exposed to 900 pounds, the lanyard and equipment's gonna be exposed to 900 pounds, as well as the anchorage connector and anchorage, 900 pounds. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between whatever force is in the system and what the anchorage and equipment has to hold. So this could be a self-retracting lifeline, could be a vertical lifeline and rope grab, could be a ladder climbing device. The key is it's one anchor, one system, whatever is generated in the fall, that's what it all has to support. And that is the biggest difference between a vertical system and a horizontal lifeline. So with the horizontal lifeline, I have two anchors. So that load, that force, whether it's 900 pounds or whatever weight, 
that wants to distribute itself between those two anchors. And it depends on the line, the span, the material, how that load, uh, how that load is handled. But the first thing I want everybody to recognize is number one, horizontal lifelines are in a category all on their own. Okay? They are different. Vertical systems, OSHA says 5,000 pounds per anchor. You know, that rule does not apply to horizontal lifelines because we have two anchors and a lot of funky stuff that happens when we have a flexible line. So, to illustrate this point, I've got a, uh, uh, a rope set up here, real sloppy, it's really loose. I got two anchors and I have a load cell here in the end. Here at my feet, I have a 35 pound kettlebell. And between the D-ring and the carabiner webbing and the kettlebell, I'm floating somewhere between 35 and 40 pounds. So I'm gonna put different weights and different loads on this cable, or sorry, not cable, on this rope. And you're able to see the relationship between the load and what happens with the horizontal. Stop. I just set it on there gently. There we go. I don't know if I need to realign that, Chris, if everybody can see it okay. Thank you. All right, so I purposely set this up in this manner to get a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay? We all recognize in a regular or a vertical fall arrest system, whatever force is generated, that's what the anchor and equipment is exposed to. Okay? So this line, with this amount of sag, with this loading on it, I've got probably 36, 37 pounds on here. And I'm generating, I think, 40 or 44. So for all intensive purposes, there's a one-to-one -one relationship there. But that's all because this line sags so much. Okay? So if I could bring these two ropes together and anchor them from the ceiling and have two parallel lines coming down to that weight, that 40 pounds that's hanging here, each rope would have 20. Okay? So as those ropes start separating and this angle starts to increase at 120 degrees which is approximately what I've got set up here that's when you hit you know um, uh, 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 the equilibrium if you will that's when you hit a breaking point if it's less than 120 degrees the load is shared okay it's 50 percent 60 70 you know 80 90 at 120 degrees of this angle 100% of this load is t tensioned, if you will, from that anchor through the equipment to that other anchor, okay? And that's demonstrated here by my load cell, not exact perfectly, but like I said, I've got roughly 40 pounds on here and I'm showing 40 pounds at the end. So as this line gets flatter, as it goes from 120 and starts flattening out, it goes higher than a one-to-one -one relationship. It goes through a multiplier, okay? And that multiplier can be high as, as high as 10, 12, 15 to one, okay? So that's what we're gonna do now, is this really isn't typical of a horizontal lifeline. This is pretty loose. Most lifelines are, are you know, taut, because a sloppy lifeline means good things for the force on the ends, but it's a bad thing in regards to the person hanging from it is they're gonna fall further, need more clearance, and rescues might be more difficult. So I'm gonna take the weight off. We're gonna readjust our line a little bit here. So now this is a little more typical of a horizontal lifeline. Okay? The line's got a little bit of tension in it. Uh, it's shoulder height or higher, but you have the same problem whether it's foot level or, or it's a steel erector system that's right around the waist. But the idea is, is the line's got a little more, more tension to it. Just gonna check my load cell. All right. Add our kettlebell. So everything is exactly the same. The span is the same, the rope is the same, the anchors, the weight is the same. The only thing I've changed is the tightness 
or the sag that was in that line. I tightened it up a little bit. And you can see I no longer have, you know, 120 degrees. Now I'm, you know, 130, 140. So the line's a little tighter. And you can see what's happening to the force on the end. I'm floating right around that 104, 105 pounds. So the point I want to get across with horizontal lifelines is that number at the end. It changes with every single lifeline that is built. Okay? That number is what creates the problem for everybody because this load goes through a multiplier or can go through a multiplier depending on the site specifics of the line. Okay? So this line, this exact rope, this exact kettlebell, all of these parameters, I have roughly a three to one multiplier. I got 35 pounds here, it's hanging there, it's not doing anything else, and I'm generating 104, 105 pounds on the end. So 35, 70, 105, it's roughly a three to one multiplier. So if this were a fall arrest system, person has a harness on, they're connected into this with a lanyard, they fall, shock absorber deploys, the load on the line is gonna be 900 pounds, that 900 pounds isn't 900 pounds as it translates through this line. It's, it would go through a three to one multiplier. So this line, given these characteristics, would be exposed to 9, 18, 2,700 pounds worth of tension. Okay? That's the main difference with these horizontal lifelines and vertical systems is, this, uh, is force vectors. You know, my, my load has both a magnitude and a direction, so it can go through a multiplier when I go past that 120 degrees, okay? So that changes every single time, okay? If I change the number of people on this line, if I put two or three people on here, that's gonna change my loading. I change the material. I go from a static kermantle rope to a uh, double braid, Maybe I chain manufacturers and they use a wire rope, you know, seven by 19. Uh, another manufacturer might use wire strand, you know, one by nine, one by seven. The behavior characteristics will also change that number. I have a lifeline that's outside and it could heat up to 105 degrees in the summer and cool off to minus 10 in the winter. That's gonna have a dramatic effect on the line. So unlike vertical systems, they're quite predictable. Horizontal lifelines have a, have a degree of unpredictability to them, and nobody's comfortable just having the end user set them up on their own, okay? So it gets worse when you add a little bit of fall to it now, okay? So here's our first challenge uh, for this session. I'm gonna pick this 35 pounds up and drop it about 18 inches, maybe a foot, foot and a half into the line. It's gonna have a three to one multiplier, so everybody can type into the chat box what you think the loading is gonna be on the end of this line. And to some degree, it's gonna be a complete guess because I'm not gonna be accurately dropping at any particular distance. We're just gonna see what occurs. And it's a way of me showing you that, that a 200 pound person doesn't represent 200 pounds when they fall. It's whatever the capacity of the energy absorber is in the system. So here we go. Got my bell back up so I don't hit myself. Everybody thought it was gonna be a lot more exciting than that, didn't you? Turn on to my max. Does that show up okay, Chris? Yeah, you're good. So 396 pounds. So <clears throat> system held, but that 35 pounds falling a foot and a half, you know, generated uh, 400 divided by three we're gonna be you know, just under uh, 120, 130 pounds, okay? Or a little more. So it's this multiplier that creates the problem. So I think everybody can understand the loading easy enough. So now let's talk about what, what OSHA says, all right? OSHA, first of all, 5,000 pound anchors for vertical systems does not apply to horizontal lifelines. Okay, that's probably the number one mistake that I see people make is they start connecting a horizontal lifeline uh, you know, to 5,000 pound anchors. If this was a fall arrest system and I had two people on here using 12 foot FF energy absorbers and each of them represented 1,350 pounds of force, 
I could have a potential moment if they both fell in the middle side by side, it's rare, but it's possible, we could have potential loading on that line of 2,700 pounds. If it had this characteristics to where there is a three to one multiplier, there would be, you know, 27, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, close to 7,000, 8,000 pounds of loading on that line. So if you just connected to 5,000 pound anchors, you're getting dangerously close to breaking equipment, failing anchors, or whatever the situation may be. So going back to OSHA, they really say two things about horizontal lifelines. And every state, uh, province, as well as uh, organizational regulations, EM385, Department of the Navy, they say very si similar things on horizontals. Number one, they shall be designed and used and installed under the supervision of a qualified person. Okay? And number two, that they have to maintain a safety factor of at least two. Okay? So the key to horizontal lifelines is you have to know that number. Okay? You have to multiply that actual loading by two, and that's what gives you your design requirement of the line. So if I have a horizontal lifeline, you know, that's going to generate 3,000 pounds, 6,000 pounds is the design requirement for my anchor, rope, turnbuckles, shackles, all the rest of it. The equipment here is just a typical fall arrest system. Okay? It's the resulting load that happens to the horizontal lifelines is where you need the assistance of a qualified person. Okay? Also, you need the qualified person to deal with the end anchorage. All right? Gravitech systems will always recommend using a professional engineer for all of your fall protection things or for all your fall protection issues. And horizontal lifelines is a good example of why you want to do that. A lot of equipment manufacturers will do this engineering for you. They'll supply the line, they'll engineer the line, they'll design the line, they'll even tell you what the end loading anchoring is, is going to be. But it's this part that's the challenge. So let's say, for example, our line generates 3,000 pounds of tension. So my design spec for the line following OSHA's two to one factor of safety is 6,000 pounds. Most people would look at this beam and go, yep, that beam can easily support 6,000 pounds. But that isn't the question. The question is, is there 6,000 pounds of residual strength in that beam? Because this, sorry, not beam, the column, this column is already doing a job. It's holding up the building. It has a certain capacity, and some of that capacity is being used by its main function of holding up the building. So now once I give it a secondary function, you know, um, uh, with different loading on the beam, connecting into it, you know, uh, and a 6,000 pound design requirement, that's where you need your uh, engineer, okay? Because that's where a lot of the, the design work of the horizontal lifeline comes in, isn't so much this part, it's looking at the residual strength of all these structures that you're connecting into, okay? All right. <clears throat> then dealing with the second part of OSHA, uh, or, sorry, they say designed, used, designed, installed, and used under the supervision of qualified person, which maintains a safety factor of two to one. I think we understand the loading. I think we understand the two to one factor of safety, depending on the number of people, fall distances, and all the rest of it. Let's talk a little bit about the designed and used under the supervision of a qualified person. So for that, we're just going to walk over here to our temporary systems. better if I stand in front of it. <laughs> All right, so OSHA says horizontal lifelines shall be designed, installed, and used under the supervision of a qualified person, person which maintains a safety factor of at least two. So the first part of that requirement kind of lends employers to believe that the designer of the line, that qualified person, needs to physically be present every single time somebody's connected to the line. And I don't believe that's the case. All right. The intent behind that regulation is that your horizontal lifeline has been properly designed, it's been properly installed, and it's being properly used under the supervision or guidance of that designer, okay? So at least for these temporary systems, okay, the design work is done by the manufacturer. They only supply you with X number of feet of rope or cable. 
they dictate that you can only have one or two people connected to it. But most importantly, they supply very, very detailed instructions. Inside of those instructions, it tells you what is acceptable equipment to hang from here, the minimum heights of the line, and most importantly, there's a little clearance chart. Okay? So depending on the span and what equipment I have hanging off that line, I can cross-reference that and it'll tell me how much clearance I have. So that's the intent behind the design installed under the supervision of a qualified person is that it's just not two people grabbing a cable and a come along and stretching cable in between two points. There's a little more uh, thought and certification that goes behind these horizontal lifelines. Any system that, that Gravitech system creates, our engineering department's a miniature construction company. So we do the design, we do the installation, and there's a user's guide as well as the specs and drawings and compliance documentations that go along with it. And then it's up to the employer to look after the supervision of it according to those instructions. So, great, let's work our way back over there. I did that on purpose to weave my cameraman through the, through the maze that is our training floor. All right, so to kind of summarize horizontal lifelines, everybody, uh, if you have them on site, number one, recognize that they're different. Okay? They are not your typical 5,000 pound vertical system. There's different loading requirements and there's a different requirement for it from a OSHA and a compliance point of view. Number two, Ask the questions and make sure you get your qualified person involved. Ideally, it's a professional engineer understanding what some basics of fall protection to determine your strengths. And just as importantly, make sure that you've got the clearance, there's a rescue plan, and all the associated equipment that can go with it. And number three, resist the temptation to build your own line. Okay? It can be potentially dangerous. All right, if you just get two people to grab a come along and cable and start stringing cables between two points without knowing what that end loading is going to be, it is very dangerous or potentially dangerous that you're going to start breaking lines and actually, you know, uh, uh, it's illegal as well. Okay? So that's it for today's session. I have had requests from people to start um, uh, to give a couple of minutes at the end of these sessions where people can type in comments and ask questions. So I'm going to start doing that from now on. Uh, so for today and future sessions, feel free to type in any questions, uh, and we'll always ask at the end that it's if there are any. So I understand we have a question. Yeah, one question here, Kevin. So far, uh, first off, saying great job, Kevin. Uh, question is, does oh, that's Anchorage my planted question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, does Anchorage elevation improve outcomes where horizontal lifelines are concerned? Uh, not really. Okay. If I understand the question correctly, they're saying if I have a higher anchorage, will that reduce the load on the end anchor? And the answer is no. Okay. What, what affects the load on the end anchor is how much force is being put down on it, okay, as well as the material and the ultimate tension that's in the line. Okay? So a higher anchor is always a good idea okay, because it reduces fall distance. So the answer to your question would be yes if it reduces the force. And chances are it doesn't reduce the force because most you know, situations, the force for the person is controlled by the personal energy absorber or the clutching mechanism out of an SRL. So, Anchorage elevation alone will not affect the end anchor strength unless it affects the ultimate force. So I hope I answered that correctly, but drop me a note, give me a call if, uh, if, I, missed the, if I misinterpreted your question at all. Great, any others? Not as of right now. You've just done such a smashing job educating everybody on this. They just yeah, so I either did a really, really good job or a really poor job and confused the heck out of everybody. All right. Uh, so that's it for today, everybody. One quick note, happy birthday to anybody out there who's celebrating a birthday on September 3rd. You know who you are. And thanks a lot, and we will see you next week. Thanks, folks.